Okay, I had stopped at the ten horns of Charlemagne at, at his death, which are his kids. He's got at least ten boys, okay, who end up becoming kings. You can look at this, his, you know, look at the Carolingian dynasty and you'll see that. Okay, he's got one girl, Gisela, but he, she, she marries off. Mostly he didn't marry off his girls. He sent them to nunneries. Which is kind of a crazy thing to do. But the boys, he had, you know, installed as kings. <clears throat> he ends up having, like, his progeny ends up being about ten. But, you end up calling it seven to ten. Because there were partisan clergy who were, in the ensuing generations, um, taking sides between one or two of the horns. They fought with each other like Constantine's kids did. See, that's what happens. When you align yourself with the Whore of Babylon, which is a religion, in this case the religion was Catholicism, and you force it down people's throats, even though he had a really good teacher named Malcolm who didn't want to do that. He aligned himself with the Pope. His dad actually did it. So his dad became Kai of the Franks. Okay, so now Charlemagne is crowned by a pope, hold the first Holy Roman Emperor, which I didn't cover and should. So it's like icing Kai. Okay? The Kai here is his crowning. It's actually at, at scene, but it's at the end of the year. It's at Christmas, which is close to when John is writing. So you could call it the New Year. Okay, so he's Kai as of January 1. Okay, so Pepin was a Kai, <laughs> crowned by a Pope. And now our boy is a Kai, crowned by a Pope, except he's crowned Holy Roman Emperor, not merely King of the Franks, by a Pope. See, that's the problem. He's crowned by a Pope. There's no separation of church and state, technically. But there is a de facto, because one of Char Charlemagne didn't know any better, thank God. Or maybe Alcuin did and was giving him the right advice. Alcuin dies about five years before this point. But we're talking back here. That's 801, January of 801. Um, Alcuin's going to die the next year. Okay. Or maybe he dies in, in 803, I forget. 802 or 803, which is right here. But at the same time, you know, Charlemagne on the one hand is like, Oh, Pope this, Pope that, we're Catholic, blah, 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 that's the true faith, yada, yada, yada. And he shouldn't be doing that. On the other hand, he's not trying to tell them what to teach. He is trying to impose behavioral standards on them because the monasteries at this point had gotten really notoriously bad. I mean, raping and pillaging and stealing, kind of like the knights. When I mean, you hear the word about the knights and chivalry and all that stuff in the in the Middle Ages, they weren't chivalrous. Okay, they used their they used their weapons and their horses and all that stuff in order to steal from you. Okay, they were just brigands. They were just pirates like everybody else. Okay, well that was true of a lot of the monasteries too at this point. And they were really good in the 500s. In the 600s, 700s, they start to become corrupt. And by Charlemagne's day, it was kind of like nobody could read. You were a monk, but you couldn't read. Well, then what's the point of the Bible? And that was Charlemagne's big reform. Yes, hi, if you're a monk, you need to learn how to read. And then I want you to teach the people around you who are not monks how to read. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But he's he's like mandating it. And he's, he writes all these books or gets all these books written in his name on correct practice and stuff like that. So he's veering really, really close to what Justinian did here. Which is totally wrong. Okay, and it doesn't survive him. Justinian's command never ends up after that becoming, there's more of a separation of church and state after Justinian than before. But see, when Charlemagne does this, 
then he legates that to his ten horns then they're going to do something of the same thing without separation of church and state you do, you do not have the land that Christ grew up in there was separation of church and state there was a lot of apostasy in Christ's day but there was a lot of separation of church and state too if you believed or you didn't believe well that was your that was your thing and yeah you could get thrown out by the by the Sanhedrin you could get thrown out and excommunicated but it didn't mean anything it didn't stop you from being saved it didn't stop you from getting Bible teaching here it would stop you from everything you know when it says in Revelation 13 you can't trade without the mark that's kind of the way it was in these older times too which is what this is taste you know um, tracing what kind of beast ruled that would say you can't buy or sell without the mark okay well a religified kingdom would do that and that's kind of what you know Shaman did a lot of good things and he had a lot of the right ideas and he was you know a baby Christian so of course he wouldn't understand a lot of things but it's still whorish and he still got the support of the Catholic Church in order for his own rule to be valid so he's a Kai he's not really a Kaiser he's just like Pepin he's just a half king so long as he's not on his own so he too is deemed a Kai like his dad All right. Now, where, get, where the plot really thickens is right here the Holy Roman Empire. The Pope crowned him. Charlemagne either knew or didn't know. There's a lot of debate about that. You know, how could he not know when he walks into the room where he's supposed to enjoy Christmas with the Pope and he sees this big crown there? How could he not know? Well, whether he knew or not, the Pope's motive is what you want to focus on here. During this time, from the start of Pepin, remember I said that because the Arabs were fighting against the Lamb and you had, and I was making all these click marks right here. The Popes are now between a rock and a hard place. The West and the East are being invaded by Arabs too, but their, their land mass, Italy, juts closer to where the Arabs have their power without Byzantine help or without um, German help being able to come in time. So what the popes really needed to do is figure out, well, how can I make sure that both of you are my friend when you're both really kind of opposed to each other? And at the same time, how can I be your kingmaker so that you'll be more beholding to me for your own political power? That was the dilemma they were in at this point back here in 733 once they saw the victories that are going on in east and west but south was ter territory the Arabs controlled and south was where they were vulnerable so they got to figure out how are they going to cater to you know the Byzantines on the one hand who did have some Italian territory and the, the northern then Merovingian territories that were run by you know Pepin's ancestors specifically um, Charles Martel so as they're going through these periods, they still got the same dilemma going on because the Arabs didn't go away. They just got more and more beaten. And they'll end up having a sort of swan song against Charlemagne before he dies. But that's kind of another story. The big point is that it was suddenly in the Pope's interest to create a second Holy Roman Empire that was not Byzantium. The biggest reason why it was in their interest first of all the the location it was easier for Charlemagne to get down from Aachen where he was which is sort of like northwestern I don't know Aix Chapelle so it's really part of France today but it was sort of easier for, for Charlemagne to get down there faster and the Byzantine Empire was a little more lax okay but more importantly to the Pope at the time, the guy who crowned, I forget his name, I think it was Stephen, it might not have been Stephen, who crowned Charlemagne in 800, of more concern to him was the fact that um, Irene had come back into power as a result of Constantine V dying and then her husband Leo IV 
she'll come back into power right about here. Really more about during this. Okay. She starts, she gets into power. And, because her husband dies. And her husband was iconoclast, which was their version of Back to the Bible. And she wanted to worship icons, which were little paint, which were paintings. But they, they treated them like statues. And they were big on relics too. And all kinds of stuff like that. She wanted to go back to that. Which would mean a de-emphasis on Bible. So she had her own whoredom. That she was sitting on. By the end of this time. And the Pope in the West didn't like it. Because even though she was much more pro him. Than Leo the fourth her her husband had been because she's now a widow and she's got a kid that's too young to be ruling yet so she's acting as regent he don't like it that she's female running the place and he sees this real strong leader in Charlemagne who did just deliver him from the Lombards and he's thinking you know I'm gonna hedge my bets and one of the other things that's going on during this period that I didn't cover much but uh, the links do that are associated here is that Charlemagne starting in 780 is looking across the pond as it were to Irene because her husband Irene's husband died in 780 so now Charlemagne is looking at her and saying well I don't particularly like this gal but boy oh boy then we'd have the Byzantine Empire uniting and we uniting and then we can defeat the Arabs and in between them they had all these other groups that they wanted to defeat the Bulgars and the Hungarians and the, the Saxons and the Jutes and the Russians were just starting to, to well yeah they were just starting to be a problem they were still pagan at that point they would be pagan until um, this clause down here the Russians start being stop being the well the Moravians and the Balkans start Christianizing right in here but this is all before that happened so Charlemagne is looking across the pond and it's like well I don't really like Irene but oh if we unite our two empires that'd be a real good thing and he and he was a little bit chary of the popes okay so it's like well then we'll have this buffer between us and yada 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 so he started making overtures to either offer one of his kids to Irene's kid for marriage and unite the empires that way and sometimes he made an overture well, why don't you and I get married and she's like I don't know 40 45 at this point okay and he already had like six wives okay that's another story he had a lot of wives so the Pope is looking at the, uh, hearing all about these overtures between Charlemagne and Irene thinking yeah, I need to break this up so that's where he comes up with the brilliant idea of creating a Holy Roman Emperor in the West knowing full well that the Byzantine Empire is going to say we're the only Rome how dare you and he's picking a side knowing he might lose the Byzantine Empire but Charlemagne had united what ended up becoming Europe to such an extent that it was stronger than the Byzantine Empire then especially under Irene because there were a whole bunch of people under Irene who didn't like her being the queen either and she was losing every battle that she directed okay so she, that means she wasn't good at picking the people to run her battles for her because she couldn't do, she couldn't fight the battle on her own anyway it's not her field but she should be able to pick the right people and she didn't okay so she was losing battles right left and center so there was a real concern that the Byzantium area would topple and so what would the Pope do but start up a new Holy Roman Empire in the West which was sure to insult the East but then he'd have Charlemagne backing him and Charlemagne had to know something of that he wasn't born yesterday he'd already been king of the Franks in 768 at this point alright 
So he wasn't exactly ignorant of all this stuff. So he was sort of making a deal with the devil, and the devil wanted to make a deal with him. And they're both hedging their bets, and that's beastly too. Okay? So Charlemagne the Beast has that as his legacy when he dies right there at Kerata. Kerata. And he has at least ten kids that end up being kings. And they have no peace. Just like Constantine's sons, except they last longer. They're a little more, you know, clever. And they care more about the word getting out and stuff like that. But it's just pretty much more of the same. So I don't know how, how to fill this in because it's kind of like, well, I'll just be telling the same story over and over and over. It's a Louis or a Charles or another Louis or another Charles. And I, bleh. Okay, well, by 9-11, okay, a little less than 100 years, so those three generations, the West Carolingian, West Francia, some call it East Francia, line dies out in 9-11. The other branch is mostly Italian, and it lives until 987, and then it dies out. Now, there, he keeps on having progeny. But they don't have that high status after that. Okay? The Capetians come in. Okay? And take over the, the France. You know, basically France and, and Germany. And then you got Otto. And that's where our story ends right here. And it's extremely clever. It's, this is the cleverest of all the puns. When you get down here. It's the only other time it's sevens. Remember the last time it's seven was just a tag. Just a tag. Paul, 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 and Matthew in the middle. Okay? Paul, Paul, Mark in the middle. So, hi, yes, see, I, I know Mark. Luke in the middle and Ephesians. But he's drawing mostly on Ephesians. Alright, so having drawn mostly on Ephesians, the big thing in Ephesians was the Severan Mothers, the Musterion, the women, resulting in the mother church which was Constantine playing the whore uniting church and state which for the first time in Revelation is actually called a whore Paul didn't use those terms but when you looked at the history that he was talking about that's pretty much what it was you didn't need the words to know that's what it was so when our boy John gets down here the whole the whole actual syllable count if you ignored all these little red things, okay, which are elisions, if you took them all out, took every single one of them out, the actual syllable count would be 875. But the reason I know that he intends it to be this 868 instead is because of what that date signifies. And this is the kicker pun of all. It references a woman named Theophanu. Now there are actually two of them and they're connected. Okay, what basically happens is, you know, Charlemagne's line dies out. That means a new line comes in and in the Western Empire there are basically two lines that come in. The Capetians and the Ottonians. Otto, Otto the First. Well, Otto the First had the same designs on recreating Rome that Charlemagne had and the same designs on uniting with Byzantium that Charlemagne had and in his case he wanted to be a little more independent of the church he wanted to be able to throw off the church if he wanted see because that's where it says I mean I didn't go into this too much and they will hate the harlot and they will desolate her they will make her naked and and eat her flesh okay that's actually what is going on during this ter period in history with Charlemagne's kids they they get more and more dis enamored of the Pope and the, and the Pope of them there's more and more fighting that goes on and they fight with each other too over who should get split the pie because Charlemagne split up the empire amongst his at that point he had three kids, and then he, the other kids die, and he only has one kid. The one kid inherits, and then the one kid 
Louis the Pious ends up having a lot of sons and that was the problem. He had three and he divided up his kingdom with three and they didn't like the fact that he divided up with three and they were fighting with each other before they even, you know, before he even died. And then he ends up having a fourth kid and then he starts reallocating the resources among the three to take into account the fourth kid and they hate Louis the Pious even more for doing that. And then he has a fifth kid and they, they all hate him more. So it's hatred, 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 fight, 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 fight. And they're fighting against the religion, because Louis the Pious was really pro-church, pro-Catholic church. And they want to destroy the religion, and they want to destroy him, and they want to destroy her, and they want to just destroy, 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 and burn him with fire. There were several civil wars that keep on occurring amongst his kids okay including partisan clergy on one kid's side or another so they last a little longer than Constantine's kids but they die out so then in come the Capetians and then in come the Ottonians and by the time you get here this lady here Theophanu okay she was the wife of the son of Constantine the seventh who receives a lot of sarcastic treatment from Mark a lot of sarcastic treatment from Mark he's basically John is basically tagging the whole last section of Mark but it's so complicated I don't know how to explain it but the point is is that is that Constantine the seventh has um, a son and Constantine the seventh was had spent most of his life being unfairly under the regency of a guy named Romanus, who forced him Constantine the seventh to marry Romanus's daughter. It so happened that they happened to fall in love with each other or something because they end up becoming best really close. Romanus then, by about 940 A.D., gets a sort of a conscience like, why did I do this to you, Constantine the seventh? I think I need to resign. The minute he starts thinking like that. His own sons, who hope to replace Constantine the Seventh, rebel against their own father, and then the daughter, who married Constantine the Seventh, turns on her two brothers. It's a soap opera, okay? Turns on her two brothers and gets them all ousted. Daddy retires to a monastery. That's what you did in those days. But sometimes you got blinded, and sometimes you didn't. He didn't get blinded, and the kids get turned out, and I forget their nastily dealt with or killed or something so what that left was the son of the daughter of the guy who went to a monastery Romanus the first his daughter and Constantine the seventh had a kid named Romanus they named him Romanus the second Romanus the second said to his dad look dad don't arrange a marriage for me let me find my own and for some reason Constantine the seventh was receptive to that and it turns out that there was a girl who was the daughter of an innkeeper and I forget her actual name initially Anastasia or something like that and he falls in love with her they're both like 16 and 15 at the time in 956 they marry I think she's 15 and he's 16 years old you know Romeo and Juliet kind of story she ends up they, they're, they're in love. They have kids. Okay? But he, Romanus II, only lives for another five years after his dad died. So at this point, she's got a five-year-old kid and a three-year-old kid. And she's young. She's like 25 by the time her husband dies. What's she going to do? Well, the ugliest guy in the kingdom is also the most successful general in the kingdom, and so she turns to him. And she marries him. And he's such a putz that somebody, whether it was her or not, arranges to get the putz killed within about six or seven more years. Okay, during this time, allegedly, and I have no proof against it, but... This is what they say, but, you know, take a little grain of salt. There was a guy named John 
that was her lover at the same time she was married to the second guy okay that John wanted to be the next emperor and they they were gonna marry but the priest see this is where the whore comes in the priest wouldn't let him marry okay whether they should have married or not whether it was in you know adultery or not the point is they did want to marry the priest wouldn't let them and basically the priest said because it's the priest interfering with politics this is where you got the the gune again the whore of religion says hi if you marry Theofanu okay she's already had two husbands you marry her then you can't be emperor and so he had to choose between being emperor and her it was no contest he wanted to be emperor now here's the kicker the guy's name was John Timiskes he had a niece also named Theophanu, so you can imagine where it comes from. It wasn't his own daughter, as far as anybody knew, but his brother's daughter. Okay, but that was close enough to give her a princess-like status. Alright? And prior to him coming to the throne, the guy who they end up killing, and, and Simis had something to do with uh, the sec her second husband's death um, there was an embassy that came and this is where the story is or it, it's in verse 18 this is a really good story to read seriously you have to read this okay is that it no, where is the story oh yeah right there before the niece got involved already to the to the Romanus the, the, the replacement king whatever his name was I forget um, there was an embassy sent from Otto the first from Otto the first was sent to Byzantium saying hi do you have a princess that my newly young son can marry and this is the story about that the actual guy who actually made the marital negotiation with Theophano's second husband. It's a hysterical story. you got to read this. this. That's contemporary at that time. That's not some commentary by a later historian. That's the guy who actually had to do the negotiation. Okay? And this was the name of the guy who was the ugly person. Her second, Theophano's second husband. Okay? Focus is a every time there's a focus involved, there's bad stuff that happens, and it it goes right on through history. It started early and it keeps on going. Okay, this Theophanu was married to the Romanus II. When he dies in 963, she has to marry this really ugly, nasty person in order to protect her five and three-year-old kid. Okay, he's so bad. That she either cooperates in or allows him to get killed by her lover, or supposed lover, who is John C. This guy, John C. Zemis case. You can search on the internet on that. Okay. Once he kills this guy, he is offered the emperorship so long as he won't marry Theophanu, even though he's the killer. He's the assassin, admittedly assassin, apparently. He's not allowed to marry the empress with her two kids. By the priests. They won't allow it. So, he has to put her away in exile. Meanwhile, he's got a niece. Okay? He's got a niece, this one. And Otto comes back. Otto the first comes back and says, Hi, I want to marry off my kid to a princess. It didn't work so well the first time. This was the actual marital negotiation by the actual guy who did it in 963 or thereabouts. So Otto comes back and says, Hi, John, you're the new emperor now. 
Would you mind giving me one of your kids that I can marry off my kid to? And John says, sure, why not? And he gives him a niece who's got the same name. So now do you understand why John ends it here at 868? Because that's the year that the older Theophanu becomes Theophanu, marries Romanus II. And what I've just told you is all the like epilogue of that story. Does that tell you what the whore of Babylon is like or what? Think about it. That's it. Sarcasm tour, stage one, complete.